You're listening to the UKC Hunting Ops Podcast, celebrating hunting dog heritage, competition, and community. United Kennel Club has been the hunting dog sports home for coon hounds, beagles, retrievers, pointers, cur feist, and more for over 125 years. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the UKC Hunting Ops Podcast. I'm Trevor Wade, your Coonhound Program Manager here, and I'm joined today by Alan Gingrich, the Director of the Hunting Ops Program. Uh, and today, we're going to be talking a little bit more about coonhounds. Uh, we're going to start out the episode talking about our Triple Crown Program and finish it off towards the end talking about our telemetry rules. So people better hang around to the end for that. Yeah, you've laid out a couple topics here, and I really like uh, what we're going to dive into today. Yeah. That first thing I'd like to talk about, though, is is a little bit about our upcoming plans for this year. Training season is getting started here in Michigan now that it's nice and warm. So uh, you got any plans here in the next couple of weeks to months with your with your dogs? Oh, for sure. You know, this is as the time of recording here is the first part of uh, July here. So July 8th is a big day here in Michigan. You know, that's when uh, running season opens back up again. And so uh, I'm not going to waste much time. I'll probably be heading north here this month before too long with say do you have plans to go to the upper peninsula this yeah month that's already? what i'm talking about yeah yeah so yeah it's you know it's hot this time of the year and the biggest thing you, you to that you deal with up there are the deer flies yeah. uh for the most part but uh i've found ways to combat those for the most part and it's not going to keep me from uh spending a day or two up there with the dogs that's for sure I've seen some of your camping setups up there. You you guys got a pretty good setup going. Yeah, that's pretty primitive, but it it works and it's <laughs> a lot of fun. <laughs> I love that up there. Just find an area to sit around, you know, make up a little camp there and and uh, turn dogs loose right there. You can hear them for a mile around you, you know, and there's plenty of places for them to hunt. And I just love it. And it's a good time to uh, start getting your dogs kind of geared up for the fall season. Yeah. And the good thing about the way the calendar falls this year is uh the training season is going to open up on a weekend, so we won't be coming here dragging butt in the mornings when we're on the phones with people. So that'll be handy. Yeah. But what are you? What what uh, beagles are you running? You're uh, talking about rabbit hunting up there for the the hares in the Upper Peninsula. What beagles are you running this year? Uh, I've still got the two younger males. I keep calling them young males, and they have been young, but they're this is shoot. They they turned three years old this year, you know. So they're uh, time flies. You it, had just it, gotten a couple of those when I started here. I yeah, think. yeah, you know. So I have the two males, and I have a female too that I run. Uh, she's a little bit older. She's about six now this year. So I have those three, and the older female just uh, passed on us here a couple of weeks ago. So uh, so that puts me down to three beagles, but that's plenty enough and. And really, I love to, when I go up there, I love to run them together for one, you know, but I also like to take that time and solo. Sure. Yeah, I've kind of uh, uh, got my bunch down a little bit. I'm down to, to two hounds myself. I got a, a three-year-old walker male this year and a, just a one-year-old black and tan who's, who just started before the quiet season started, treeing good coons. He probably has 15 or 20 uh coons under his belt now so yeah this, but it uh, sounds like he's be come, good yeah it sounds like he's coming along pretty good for you though isn't he He started out more track than tree but lately he's uh he's starting to put it together and so we'll see what this bit of a layoff did to him here for the past few weeks but uh you know kittens will be on the ground there'll be some good tracks and you know even, i you know i'm used to east tennessee hunting where it can be pretty humid and hot at night even and and a lot of the, even in the summer up here in michigan at night there's some nights that are rough, but sometimes it's pretty manageable to get out and run. It makes for good tracking conditions, I think. Yeah, but that's fun running the young hounds like that and watching them progress, isn't it? Absolutely. Favorite part of it is running a hunt, uh, a young dog, especially this time of year. Yeah, I've never, I've never claimed to be a good pup trainer or anything like mm -hmm. that, but uh, it takes a lot of patience sometimes. And like you, I think you got a little frustrated with your young dog there, but uh, he's kind of turned that corner a little bit and. Hey, that's always the case, seems like, you know. I fell into the trap that we always talk about is on social media, you're seeing litter mates to this dog that are, are already cranking and, you know, uh, they've won cast even uh, before this happened or before the quiet season. And, and I was having trouble getting him to tree and stick to trees. And then all of a sudden it just clicked. So sometimes being patient is the, is the key with a young dog. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So uh, one thing I've been working on recently in the office is is uh, compiling information for an upcoming episode we're going to drop on uh, Autumn Oaks and the history of it. And, man, it has me kind of fired up for the event this year. Sometimes I think uh, when you're working it and you're close, you're, you're dealing with the ins and outs of it, it can sometimes feel tedious and you almost dread the I, – I hate to say that word, but sometimes you kind of dread – 
the uh, the ins and outs and putting together the event, but uh, looking back through the history and the old magazines and some of the material that we have here available to us and just seeing the history and the prestige and the tradition of that event, it has me fired up for this year's Autumn Oaks big time. Yeah, it's I always love that one too, and it's coming up way too fast and it'll be here before we know it. But uh, yeah, we've been talking quite a bit about it here in the last month or two, you know, but uh, gearing up for it, but. No, you're right. It's it's a lot of work, but it's also a lot of fun. I love that event. I love a lot of our events, you know, but hey, Autumn Oaks is one of the big ones. That's right. Yeah. Seems like you do a whole year's worth of work and then uh, you go up there to, or you go down to Richmond and you blink and the event's over already. Yeah. But r- uh, right I've, now. I've told you about every time we go down there, we go down there on a Tuesday and you you driving home on Sunday, you think, man, where did these days go? Yeah, exactly. Goes by it so flies fast. by. It does. Sure does. Yeah. So I just want to remind everybody that uh, entries for Autumn Oaks is open currently. Uh, August 12th is the deadline to get entered for Autumn Oaks. Uh, a few different ways to enter. Uh, as always, the online entry is open from now till midnight Eastern time on August 12th. You can go to ukcdogs.com and follow the prompts to the Autumn Oaks page and get entered there. Um and also there's the mail-in entry forms in the Coonhound bloodlines, probably not, not the most efficient way right now with some of the, the postal service issues that we're seeing, but uh, we're still seeing some of those uh, flow in to get people entered that way. Yeah. And, and you uh, make, you make a good point about that. And if it were me, you know, you can mail those in, uh, I think on one of the podcasts a couple of weeks ago, I suggested to take it to your uh, post office and get a tracking number put on it. But even better than that, the, the online thing is very simple to use. It's uh, it doesn't, take that much to navigate through it to get your dogs entered. But if it's, uh, if that's too much, I would suggest just call the office, call yep. the hunting ops department. We'll be happy to help you get your dog entered. That way, you know, your entry's in, you don't have to worry about any mail woes. Just, just so you know, if you call in the office and have a question about Autumn Oaks and you're talking to me, you're going to have a hard time getting off the phone without me getting you entered into Autumn Oaks <laughs> on the phone. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. uh, but, but yeah, speaking Trevor's of- a salesman. <laughs> <laughs> Spe- speaking of autumn oaks it, it is one of the the three events on our calendar that factor into our triple crown program yep. and that's going to be the first thing that we talk about today is the triple crown perfect and perfect. Uh, just a few particulars before we get into some of the history of it and uh, talk about some of the dogs that have won in the past and then we get to the dogs that are currently in the run in this year uh Right. The Triple Crown is a program that uh, runs off three events where a dog must compete in all three events. And that's the Winter Classic, Autumn Oaks, and the World Championship. Um, yeah, one word you mentioned in there, must compete. You know, just because you entered Autumn Oaks and didn't actually hunt in it, uh, that doesn't meet that requirement. You must actually compete. That's right. That's right. And uh, and the uh, for winning the Triple Crown, you're going to get a $3,000 check sponsored by us here at UKC, along with an embroidered jacket with the dog information and your name on there to to uh, remember that win always. Uh, and that's going to be presented at Winter Classic the following year in front of all your peers. Um, so basically a little bit about how the scoring works. The hound that accumulates the most Triple Crown points in those three UKC Triple Crown events will be declared the winner. Um, and the way that we compile the points is uh, the plus point cast winner at each of the three events are going to get points towards it. At the Winter Classic, a a plus point cast winner either Friday or Saturday night will get 50 points toward their total. That's a 100-point max for the the event. At Autumn Oaks, uh, you get 50 points for a plus point cast win. You can only hunt once at Autumn Oaks. It's one hunt ran over two nights, so that's a 50-point max. And then at the World Championship, at the zones, you can get 25 per per plus point cast win at the zones. And then when you get to the finals, there's four rounds of uh, license events at the finals where 10 points are available each round. And that's a max of 90 points total for the world championship. Yeah. And that's uh, two nights on, on at the zones, Friday and Saturday. That's right. And then the four nights at the finals. Yep. 90 points total. Yep. So now we'll uh, get into a little bit of the history of it. I know you're kind of excited to talk about the history of this program. Uh, it, it was implemented in 2000, and that's not long before you started here. So you've seen a bulk of this program uh, program yourself. Yeah, I have. You know, and the very first dog to win it in 2000 is a dog that came from my part of the country, uh, Blue River Droop Jr. Yeah. Won it the very first year on the Triple Crown. He is a 1996 model, so that kind of tells you how long we're talking here. That's been, uh, you know, 25 years now. And uh, that's just crazy to think it's been that long for me. It doesn't seem nearly that long. But uh, Droop was a, um, he was the real deal. Yeah. You know, back in those days, he was, you know, he was running our, our uh, Coonhound series at the time. 
and did very well. He won that at least once, maybe twice, I think. Uh, but uh, in in doing so, he all, also captured this first triple crown win. But that what I remember about that dog, he was so quick. You know, uh, a lot of times blue ticks were known to kind of be trailing dogs, and and he trailed. But that dog was quick on both ends, very quick. I mean, he was. <laughs> everybody in our neck of the woods knew who Droop Junior was. Let right. me just tell you that, and not just in our neck of the woods. He got to be known nationally. Did a lot of winning. Just a little dog. And he could cover some ground quick. I remember at the World Hunt, uh, he was in the World Final Four with uh, Hammerin Hank, uh, Ham or Hammerin Earl, uh, and Hammerin Hank, I think was his name, who won it that one year. Uh, and then what was the fourth dog in the cast? It was him. Uh, I forget the fourth dog. But anyways, he was... Uh, he and another dog had kind of took off, and it was a little questionable what they were running. And honestly... Uh, the owners won't make any bones about it. He would he would take off a little bit, you know, and be wondering a little bit where he's going, but he could switch so quick. And yeah. I'm pretty sure that's what he and another dog did. And I remember two of the dogs get treed right close to us here. And uh, Droop Jr. and another dog had barreled out of there with a with a track. And all of a sudden, Burkholder was handling him at the time, Steve Burkholder. And he called him treed. And I, I surprised me that quick because the last I can barely hear him, and he's got him treed. And I'm like, where you got him? He's like, right here. Yeah. I'm like, holy cow. But that's just that's just an example of how quick that dog was. Right. And um get in there and shoot. He's he's in there and he's I, I believe he was swift or uh split. But yeah, Droop Jr. was uh he was a heck of a dog. You mentioned his owners there, Jerry McAvoy and Steve Burkholder. If anybody who's watching any of our live events probably have seen him on our uh, telecast of Autumn Oaks last year and also the tournament champions this year. Yeah, same same Steve Burkholder right there. Yeah. You mean to tell me he's old enough to hunt a dog that was born in ninety six? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, looking at the the list of the dogs that have won here, and one thing that stands out to me is is uh, you know a lot of times our our historical lists are dominated by Tree and Walkers, and this one right here, uh, I, I know Tree and Walkers have the most wins out of the twenty two winners. Nine of them have been Tree and Walkers, but that's a pretty even breakdown compared to a lot of our historical lists. Uh, so it's one that uh, uh, requires a full year of running and hunting in different terrains. You're hunting in uh, some of these hunted in uh, Albany. I know Albany, Georgia, and some of them hunted mm -hmm. in Baseball, Mississippi, of course, for for Winter Classic. Then you get into Richmond, Indiana, and the World Championship moves all over the country, the zones and the finals. So it takes a consistent dog that can win in multiple uh, different places and different yeah, territories. It, it does, and it's, uh, yeah, we're most or a lot of these dogs one that got their first wins was in albany georgia that's in south georgia only about an hour and a half north of the florida line yeah so yeah yeah so uh, so like i said 22 winners as of right now the breakdown was there's been three black and tans win uh six blue ticks three english one red bone and nine tree and walkers that have brought home this title um of the 22 16 males and six females yeah this is kind of it's kind of unique in that we've had some color in the when it comes to the winners of this uh, uh triple crown you know like uh you know we see uh, the walkers dominate a lot of our programs whether it be at the world hunt a lot of other programs as well but it seems like this uh triple crown we've had a good number of other breeds uh come out on top as well yeah you know one thing just uh, it, it always seems like winter classic is a place where you may not see uh, the breakdown favor the walkers so much. It's there's more diversity down there. It seems like when you get uh, at the people that travel there, it seems like there's a bigger diversity of breeds there. And maybe the double cast wins or, or crewing wins there, and actually hunting in that event may tilt the scale in their favor with the different. I think you make uh, a diversity good, of dogs. I think there. you make a good point there because you see a lot of blue ticks in the South. You know, a lot of them, right. Louisiana, uh, Mississippi, Texas, a lot of blue ticks, and English is a big breed for Winter Classic as well. That's right past couple of years actually uh walker hasn't won uh x-bred and a english dog there for the past couple of years yeah yep. actually two two english and x-bred when i'm thinking back on it in the three years that i've yeah. been down there so yeah yeah so uh, uh looking at this historical list one thing that stood out to me is probably one of the more famous dogs since i've been in the game for the past 15 years booker hollow mojo yeah the only dog to win this twice in 2008 and 2009 uh, that was you know you had been here for a few years in that dog went on a kind of an unprecedented streak there i guess he did, and that was a that was a nice nice young dog when he came on the circuit. Uh, Robert Raxter from North Carolina had owned that hound. He trained a lot of nice ones, and including Mojo. You know, Mojo is a is a huge name in the sport now. Right. But uh, that was a real 
a real, real dog right there. People talk about his reproduction record, but apparently the dog did a lot in the woods as well. Oh, he did. He did. He was a quick little dog as well, you know, and just, uh, I mean, he could, uh, he could do it and make it look easy doing it. I hunted with him a bunch when he'd been, when he was just young still. Yeah. Looking at the list of past winners, I don't know, it would take the time to kind of go through some of them here, but you mentioned Droop Jr., uh, Thompson's Hillbilly Pepper, an English, an English owned by Chad Butcher and Dean Thompson. Yeah, I think we should cover them all. If we have time, we should cover some of this. A good opportunity sure. for us to do that. Yeah, that uh, Hillbilly Pepper. Uh, Chad Butcher, that's a name you don't see anymore, but he's from down around uh, Bluffton, Indiana, in that area. I okay. don't know what town he lives in. And he's kind of, you don't really see him around anymore. Uh, but he hunted dogs for Dean Thompson. Okay. You know, that's where all the hillbilly English come from. And Pepper was one of those that Chad used to hunt. And, um, yeah, he was our second overall winner. And Chad was a great guy. He really was. You know, I don't uh, – that's somebody you don't hear from anymore. I haven't heard from him in a in a long time. And I, I don't, I'm not sure what he's up to these days. But, uh, yeah, he hunted some good ones for Mr. Dean back in those days. Pepper was definitely one of those. Second one. Then the third one to win it in uh, 2002, uh, Black Creek Dock. That dog was uh, owned by Kel Kevin Phillips and BT Love. Now, they lived in South Georgia there, and, and Kevin hunted dogs for, he partnered with a lot of dogs with BT Love. Uh, Black Creek Doc uh, was, was one of those, and he was a, uh, a well-built little dog. I remember when you, if, if, uh, in, if some of the better handlers put him in shows, he would be winning national shows. He was built that well. Right. And just a good built little, little dog. Yeah. Compact little dog. I see the next one here in 2003, uh, a familiar name here, Bingo's Northern Blue Dancer, a blue tick owned by Ron Taylor. Yeah, so there are one, two, three, four, and four years, uh, two blue ticks winning it in four years. So that uh, dancer dog, uh, Ron Taylor, he kind of made an, a name in the breed and in the sport, you know, and uh, and I remember that dog as well. He was uh, he was a solid, solid, well-balanced uh, hound old dancer was. And we're sure. kind of get kind of getting into your territory here, where you started here in two thousand four with the uh, the uh, Green Rough River Bobby Joe Angel uh, dog here, a black and tan female owned by Ted Frotterman. That was your first Triple Crown when you were here. It was, yeah. I started in the fall of two thousand four, and so the Triple Crown was basically over. I started right after the World Hunt, or right soon after, and uh, so that was determined at that World Hunt just before I started. But I remember that was the first dog. Yeah, uh, Green. I'm not sure uh, that uh, it's supposed to be Green Rough River, Bobby, Joe, Angel, Ted Froderman. Uh, but, yeah, she was uh, uh, second female to win it. But, yeah, black and tan, the first black and tan. And then our lone red bone, Vickers Hawks Red Storm in 2005 with Shane, Shane Marcis. Yeah, Shane Marcis. They were from Minnesota. Uh, they, uh, I don't see them around much these days anymore either. I'm not sure really what uh, what – uh, happened with them but Vickers is a name that uh, uh what was his first name I think I forget what his first Ricky. name Ricky Vickers yep. yeah from Kentucky he's still getting around now yeah, yeah yeah he's kind of back into it but that's where this dog came from and Storm was a good solid dog he uh he seemed like he did well wherever he went and uh, yeah but that was uh Shane Marcy's and he had a couple kids that uh, a couple of them that were in our youth programs back in those days and and uh uh, just a good family of hunters from Minnesota. But, yeah, they won it with that uh, Red Storm dog, first red bone, first and only red bone to win it. Uh, another blue tick here, some blue tick royalty. Uh, Mead's Blue Jet 8, a blue tick uh, male owned by Daniel Glista and Ed Mead. Yeah, Jet 8 was another dog that I hunted with quite a bit. And, and psh, wow, that dog won a lot. Won our, our uh, Kunan uh, annual series. Uh, he was handled by Jeff Teague mostly. And Jeff Teague was as good a handler as there are around here. I've heard that. But he handled Jet 8, and he was fast. That dog could move, and a pretty big, pretty good-sized dog. But uh, just another, he won, uh, I want to say he won, he won so many hunts. But one of them, I think, I want to say he was one of the co-winners uh, co of Winter Classic uh, the, year, uh, the year it stormed so bad. Uh, it was the only time we had a co-champion, co but... Uh, yeah, Jet 8 was another nice hound. Yeah. And here again already, just just looking at this list here, Droop Jr., Pepper, Doc, Dancer, you know, Jet 8 here. Uh, it's quickly become a pretty elite group of dogs that win this tier, this Triple Crown. Yeah. 
We've got another familiar name here in 2007. See Kevin Phillips and BT Love on the list again, this time with, I guess, a a, a pup out of the Black Creek Dock Dog, and that's Doc's Honest Abe. Yeah, there again, you know, he uh, Kevin always had a had a good hound on the end of his lead, and, and Abe was another one of those. Again, a good-looking little guy, and I did a lot of winning with him, put him in the, uh, you know, followed that series and, and, uh, and did well with him. Ended up winning 2007, yep. So here we get to 08 and 09, the two years where Mojo, Robert Raxter, and then Scott England the second year were able to capture the Triple Crown. And he was, I, I wrote down his uh, date of birth here. He was just young yet, born in uh, October of 06. So he was a fairly young dog when this, when this, when these wins were happening. Yeah, he wasn't much more than a, than a pup when he was running the annual series, you know, the year long series. And, uh, but yeah, it was, he's, he's no surprise to win that. He, he, he won a lot. Uh, get to 2010 here with Dean Woods Halley, a tree and Walker female owned by Logan and Molly Birdwell. Yeah, backing up just one second there, oh, the mojo ahead. we didn't really, you know, he is one of the big time reproducers. Now, you Absolutely. mentioned about it briefly, but I want to say he's in the top five or six in UKC reproducers now or on yeah. the reproducers list. Yeah, Dean Woods Haley, uh, another Logan Birdwell handled that dog. And Logan actually hunted a whole lot with Kevin Phillips. He's down from the same area in Georgia there. But Haley was a real nice uh, jip that uh, that won it that one year for uh, for Logan. And Logan is a guy that you don't see that much anymore, but he was in there, had a dog in our world championship this last year. Oh, So yeah. it's been a while since I saw him, but I saw him there with the, uh, the dog that he hunted this year. Had his, had his young boy with him. Uh, getting into 2011 here with R and R's Cutter Kane, a tree and walker male owned by William and Doug Reed. Um, I don't know a lot about this dog, but I believe it's one that someone from my hometown, Derek Roberts, used to handle this dog a little bit for these guys. Um, I know he had uh, some some big hunts that he won. It with this is, dog. it is, and he is off of the another dog. His sire's name was Cutter, right? Uh, and Crow who, and Grant's Cutter, right? yeah, Crow and Grant's Cutter, who uh, who won a whole lot too, right? Uh, he was up in the world hunt final four one year, but produced a lot of dogs and, and, uh, Kane was one of those and he did a lot of winning. Matter of fact, as uh, cutter Kane here got older, there were some kids from North Carolina that got their hands on him, did very well with him in our youth hunts. Yeah. Won a lot of, won a lot in the youth hunts. Um, 2012, we got another English dog in here. Haley's red river, Jody and Penny Jessup at the time owned the dog. Uh, Jody, I know, was had has had a lot of success uh, running up and down the road in these hunts. Yeah, that's a dog that I, you know, don't quote me. I, I don't want to say anything out of uh, that's not correct here, but I want to say he picked this dog up out of uh, Arkansas. And Jody is one that ran our series year after year after year and won it more than anybody else did. But uh, River was one of those, and he did. Uh, he was a very consistent dog. Yeah, when I was first getting in the comp- competition, seeing this next dog here. That one in the 2013 Battle of the Bones Blackhawk, kind of uh, first have an affinity for the black and tan breed. This was a dog that uh, always stood out in my mind because you see him in the the finals and, and on the major stage making a huge impact. This dog was owned by Dean Miller and Tim Waters at the time he won the Triple Crown, looks like. Yeah, and this dog got passed around a little bit, but he was one of those early starting dogs. He was running in our series as well early on. He was barely a year old and he was already running in the series. And he's one of those that oftentimes, you know, the whole idea of burning dogs out, just hunting them so hard you burn them out or whatever, that's not true with this dog. He was probably hunted in competition hunts as much and as hard as any dog out there. But, yeah, I did a lot of winning over the years and uh, and was a nice dog. Even from early on, he was he just had that extra edge. And, and there's another black and tan to win the uh, Triple Crown. Right. Uh, English dog here owned by uh, Jacob Barton there of Kentucky, a dog named Barton's Kraz Albany. Yeah, she was, uh, she she won a, a whole lot. And uh, Jacob Barton, man, they don't get any better than him. Uh, but yeah, he won a lot with that dog. Just a solid, well balanced female uh, who just unfortunately just passed away here in the last month or so. I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 2015, Blue Tick Mail, uh, Hamlin's Davy Crockett HTX owned by Eddie Harp and Larry Ham- Hamlin. You know, actually, one of the first times I ever came to Winter Classic, you guys uh, uh, awarded this dog his Triple Crown stuff, and then I drew this guy that night. So I was like, what am I in for? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so I've never hunted with the dog or anything. I know uh, Eddie is from Oklahoma, mm-hmm. uh, Sooner Sooner Cooners. I think that's the name Sooner of Sooner Cooners Club. Club. Yeah, yep, that's right. That's it. So, uh, yeah, another blue tick to win it. But uh, so you've hunted with him. You probably can tell me more about the dog yeah, than I can. Boy. I never did. 
Yeah, I to, to be honest with you, I think he was hunting a pup out of the Davy Crockett dog that night. We were hunting in the registered division, so yeah. But uh, it was still still pretty neat to see him get awarded, yeah. get that award, and then head to the woods with him. Yeah. Uh, twenty sixteen, Handsome Tucker, uh, tree and walker owned by Nick Brady and Phil Peterson out of West Virginia. Yeah, Handsome Tucker is a dog that came out of Northern Indiana as well when he was younger. Got uh, uh, Nick Brady ended up with him, and you you heard that dog for mm-hmm. years and years. He was. He's kind of took him out of competition just in this last year, but he was up to what eight, nine, ten years old and still doing a lot of winning until he basically pulled him out of the hunts finally here in this last year. But that dog has won so much all over the country. Another one I've had a chance to hunt with Tucker uh, back in 2017, drew him at the World Finals in Elberton, Georgia, and he was he was pretty old at that time. Even uh, I think he was seven, eight, nine years old, but he still moved around good, had a, had his uh, coons when he treated, and he did a good job that night. Yeah, you mentioned Elberton. I remember at the World Finals opening ceremonies, I had the check for Mr. Johnny Brown for old Wipeout Jim. He had a $3,000 check to give him that that day. Leading into the next one here, 2017, uh, Wide Oak Wipeout Jim. Wesley Hastings and Johnny Brown won it in 2017. Yeah, yeah. That's the one we were just talking about, isn't it? That's the one you just yeah, said, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then 2018, Micah, uh, Micah Ayers with Kentucky River Superman, another black and tan another out black, of Kentucky. Yep. There's another guy, Micah Ayers. They just don't, they just don't get any better than that. And Superman's done a lot of winning and, uh, uh, just, uh, just a super nice dog. Uh, my first, uh, triple crown program that I, uh, kind of uh, accumulated points for and everything was this next one here, Shepherd's Northern Blue Pumpkin. That's a blue tick female owned by Michael Shepherd. Yeah, Michael's out of central Indiana, hunts, has always hunted blue ticks and always had some good ones or whatever. Pumpkin's one of those, and I think you have a little bit to add on that. The, he's one that kind of came from behind a little bit and had to earn or take this win the hard way. Yeah. And that was uh, all that came really came down to the wire at the World Hunt, yeah. Marshalltown, <laughs> Iowa. Yeah, in our next segment, we're going to talk a lot about uh, the double cast winners from Winter Classic and how they're in their driver's seat right now for the, for the Triple Crown winner. But this is a case here with Michael Shepard and Pumpkin where – he didn't have double cast wins at the Winter Classic. He actually had one win at the Winter Classic, one at Autumn Oaks, and ha- uh, had 100 points going in the World Championship, where the leaders had 150, so he had a pretty big deficit. Um, he was able to get one cast win at the Zones, which got him another 25 points, and the other dogs that were tied with 150 didn't make it through. Um, so when they got there, he was down 25 points, and you know when you get to that point, you have to really make a show and at the finals to get those points, and he did. He yeah. won three casts, ended up getting fifth overall in the world, and ended up edging out the uh, the folks that were tied with 150 with 155 points. Yeah, I remember that around. night well. You know, there's one thing that Friday night going into the Friday night hunt, deep yep. into the world hunt, and then this was also on the line. And this was actually a big deal. It was some added entry yeah. to it for sure. Yep. There were people yep. definitely uh, yep. sure staying close to it here. So there's another blue tick, and then followed by another blue tick in 2020. Yeah. Uh, uh, our buddy Mark Vandeventer from Illinois with a blue tick female named Kaskaskia River Blue Molly won it. Yeah. Two blue tick females in a row. Yeah, that uh, that dog is uh, is is a nice young dog. It's just still a night champion here uh, when she won it. But uh, you might have heard of her sire, Big Country. Probably, familiar, yeah, familiar. familiar to me. <laughs> just one of the biggest names in the blue tick breed right now. Yep. And off of uh, one of Mark's females named Trudy, who uh, is also off of Blue Boomer. Uh, that is some of Ed Mead stuff. And then Salem Sadie. We talked about Salem Sadie here at right. the, on the last podcast. She was in the final four of that all oh, female six. world finals. Yeah, that's so, right. So a good bread jip right here. And that brings us to our last year's winner. Yeah, old stylish slide from down there in West Tennessee, William Wood and Justin Wallace. Uh, it, it, some pretty good uh, – you, if you have some extra time, going on our YouTube page and watching the video of them interviewing him yeah. at Winter Classic this past year will be pretty cool. He said there's some interesting things in here. But one yeah. of the things was the dog he had entered in Winter Classic ended up uh, – being injured or coming in heat, I'm not sure. And this was a, a backup plan yeah. for him. Ended up getting double cast wins at Winter Classic. Old, older dog too, isn't it? Went to Autumn Oaks for the first time and then to the World Championship and ended up uh, winning the Triple Crown. Yeah. Yeah, so we've kind of went through the particulars of the series and then talked about the past winners, but I think now it's time to shine a light on some of the dogs that are competing for the Triple Crown this year. Um, right now, we're currently sitting with uh, 20 dogs tied with 100 points, and those are our double cast winners at the Winter Classic this past year. Yeah, and that's actually a pretty uh, general number for uh, for double cast winners at the Winter Classic, usually anywhere between 16 to 22, 23. Yeah, so yeah 20 dogs this last year. 
That's exactly right. And we kind of have meaning them. these dogs were cast winners on Friday and Saturdays, and they're they have a total of a hundred triple crown points, all tied for the lead going into this upcoming autumn oaks. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I kind of have them broke down here by breed, so we can give them each a, a oh, perfect a little bit perfect. of recognition yeah. for. Yeah for being uh, at the top go. of the leaderboard right now. So there's ble uh, three black and tans right now that are tied with 100 points after the double cast wins at Winter Classic. Uh, Grand Knight Champion 2, Black River Poncho, a four-year-old male owned by Chad McCoy and Brad Heil in Indiana. Yeah, uh, Chad is one that Autumn Oaks Winter Classic, they're at all of them every year, and it just seems like year after year after year, those boys are getting a black and tan placing one or whatever. Uh, Poncho is one of those. Uh, he's done a lot of winning with, and... Um, must be a good one. I'm yeah. not hunting with him or anything, but he sure does a lot of winning with old Poncho here. And one of the th main thing about the Triple Crowns is you have to compete in all three events. Chad is always at Winter Classic. He's always at the Autumn Oaks, and he's always going to have something competing in the World Championship. So he's uh, it makes perfect sense to see him on this list. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Uh, next one is Grand Knight Champion, Champion Mogan Ridge Chocolate Chip. Old the Chocolate Chip. <laughs> Three-year-old female owned by Herbert Landers Jr. in Indiana. This is the one that Rex Robinson's running around right now, I think. Yeah, it is. And uh, he's uh, Rex is another one of those Herbie Landers and Rex. They always start out at the – they're always at the Winter Classic and same – always at Autumn Oaks. You know, they live in southern Indiana right on the Kentucky line there at Tell City where uh, 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 Landers, Herbie Landers lives. Uh, but, yeah, he's – Kind of like Chad, it seems like uh, they consistently are placing Autumn Oaks a uh, winter classic, and and here they have a dog in the running again. It's not the first time. And the third black and tan is champion night champion Muddy River Blackie, a two-year-old female owned by Corey Jeffries and Chad Smith down there in West Tennessee. Yeah, uh, Blackie, I don't know a whole lot about their line of dogs that they have other than uh, they are, are the same thing. They, they're they always at the Winter Classic in, in Autumn Oaks. You know, Chad was uh, the president of the Black and Tan Association for several years there and uh, always a good guy to kind of work with and and, uh, and same with Corey Jeffries. But uh, I know they've kept a good line of dogs for a lot of, for a lot of years and and the world hunt's going to be in Tennessee in their back their backyard. So I don't know. This dog may be one to look for this fall at the World Championship. All three of these black and tans are already qualified for the world, so we're going to see them there. I'm sure they're going to be entered in Autumn Oaks as Chad uh, and Corey. They had a the Grand Knight Champion of Breed last year. The yeah. National Grand Knight Champion of Breed Black and Tan was. Yeah. I don't know if it was this blacky female or another dog because they have two that they're pushing right now. Two young litter mates, a male and a female, and I think they're as excited about those two dogs as any dogs they've had in a while. Yeah, I think you're right. And you just mentioned being qualified for the World Hunt. You have to be qualified if you're not qualified for the World Hunt. Two cast wins here, and even a cast win at the at the uh, Autumn Oaks is not. You know, is going to be all for naught. Hopefully, these two guys all got their dogs qualified. If not, there's still time too. There's still still yeah. a lot of time left. End of August, I think. Yeah. We talked about how English dogs usually do pretty good down at Winter Classic. Seven English dogs at this yeah. year's Winter See, Classic doubled go. up. There you go. Yep. Uh, first one, Grand Knight Champion Whetstone's Dixie Chick, a six-year-old female owned by Brandon Whetstone's of South Carolina. Yeah, I don't know anything about uh, Brandon or his dog here, in, in, uh, but uh, South Carolina, you know, coming over to, to uh, the Winter Classic in uh, Batesville, Tennessee, or Batesville, Mississippi. You don't drive that far unless you're packing a nice dog. No, he must be. Now here's a Dixie dog. chick. Here's a dog that's done some win in the past couple of years since I've been on board. Champion Grand Knight Champion 2, Hard Time Black Sharpie, a four-year-old female owned by David Magrum. Uh, I know he's he's had some cast wins, uh, Autumn Oaks, Winter Classic. Uh, Seems like some world, of the world. Yeah, yeah, last year. There. Yeah. He's yeah. had some good luck, yeah. so that, that'll be a tough out, this female. We'll see her at Autumn Oaks. Yeah, and I want to say he's in the northern part of Ohio is where he's from, I do believe. David Magrum. The next one here is a night champion Indian Creek Nova, a four-year-old female owned by Gregory Wallace of Alabama. Um, then we have a night champion Clinch River Kraken, a three-year-old male owned by Bradley Devaney and Terry Jones of Tennessee. They're over in East Tennessee. This Kraken dog was just at English Days uh, back in June, had double cast wins there and was in the running for King, just barely got edged out, but it must be a consistent winner all over the country, it looks like. Yeah, yeah. Uh, shorts Balling Blitz, a male three-year-old, Nicole Merkel from Georgia, uh, on the dog at this time. Uh, we got Night Champion, G2's Light-Footed Angel, a two-year-old female owned by Storm Hayes in Indiana. Uh, Storm is kind of a, a newer guy on the scene. I, I didn't know him until just recently. He started hunting a female out of, we talked earlier, Chad McCoyne out of some of his stock. And uh, she was a really nice black and tan female. He did a lot of winning with her in a real short amount of time. And I believe she got sick on him and may have passed away. And he kind of 
switched gears here, was looking for a new dog to take her place and picked up Angel and picked oh, yeah. up right where he left off yeah. and had some luck with her. So Yeah, double cast winner at the Winter Classic. All these dogs we're mentioning were double cast winners there. Right. And the uh, the last English dog on the list is Night Champion 15 South Merle, a male two-year-old owned by Trent Willoughby of Georgia. Oh, yeah. Uh, of these seven English dogs, uh, just to know, only one of them were qualified for the world right now. That's the Indian Creek Nova dog that we talked about, Gregory Wallace, down in Alabama. So uh, they have some work to do to get themselves in position to win this Triple Crown this year. Yeah, it would be too bad if if uh, if some of them failed to get qualified for the world and get entered there and, and lose out because of this. But, uh, yeah, there's uh, just a, a good notable there. But, yeah, seven English hounds in this group of 20 is pretty good. Not bad. If you're an English fan, so you're why, uh, there you go. Yeah, of the 29 of them were Tree and Walker dogs that had double cast wins there, and we'll kind of give them their credit. Here's a name that'll be familiar. You might have heard it earlier in the show a little bit. Grand Champion, Grand Knight Champion 2, White Oak, Wipeout Jim, a yeah. male eight-year-old owned by Johnny Brown and Jeffrey Phillips of Alabama. Yeah, that old hound's still going strong. You know, it's just a well-balanced old Walker dog that uh, that they're still hunting, you know. And, and uh, yeah, he won this uh, Triple Crown in 2017, uh, but here he is again in contention again, going after it again this year. He knows what it takes to win it. One thing I see is he's not qualified for the world in our records as of today. So uh, he does some work to do there and, and not at Autumn Oaks, but he does know what it takes to win this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Grand Knight champion, John Wayne, a.k.a. The Duke, which is a male six-year-old owned by Kendrell Thompson uh, Thomas of Texas. Yeah, good to, the, good to see dogs from uh, places like that, Texas, yeah. uh, that are in the running here. So, yeah. Yeah. The Thomas boys are uh, they're a pair of brothers that we see I see at a couple of the major events and and on social media and they have a pair of nice dogs and if they go somewhere they're they're usually doing pretty good they they have some nice sounds yeah uh, Grand Knight Champion Four Trusty's King Rolo a male six year old owned by Drew Estep of West Virginia this dog's qualified for the world and he's entered in Autumn Oak, so he's well on his way yeah this dog uh, I think we talked about him on one of the podcasts he is uh, what did we one of the top cast winners of the year so far that's it yeah, for fourteen the, cast wins for the when TOC we made that one. yeah. But yeah, Drew Estep's got him. He's just a young, I, I don't know if he's aged out of the 19 juniors, years old. 19 right years old now. First year of college. But yeah, Drew's one of those kids that loves to hunt and you just put a, a good dog with like Rolo in his hands and he's going to do things, go places with him. Kind of a history there. I think his dad won Autumn Oaks a few years back with an English dog. So I would imagine that they have some some places around there to hunt and yeah. he's going to yeah. make a run at it here. Yeah, I, think, yeah, I, I know they're knows. actively running for the Triple Crown. Yep. Uh Greer's Here We Go Emma, a female five-year-old owned by Daniel Greer of Kentucky. This dog's out of We Go, some of uh, Keith Medley's stock of dogs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. Night Champion Bring On The Heat, a male five-year-old owned by Jeff Flinnegan of Louisiana. I know this dog was our reserve at Autumn, at a Winter Classic this past year with a, a double cast wins with some pretty good scores down there for that area and ended up bringing on the reserve title at winter classic yeah i remember seeing him down there obviously but uh, uh you know here again louisiana it's just good to see dogs from the deep south like that coming in and and uh in contention here for the triple crown here's another one yeah bring on the heat uh grand knight champion chandler's old jake this is a four-year-old male owned by austin and ron chandler in kentucky this is a dog that I've kind of seen its name around. It was in the Grand 16 of Autumn Oaks. Double cast wins here at Winter Classic. And I want to say it was in the running for the world last year. Made it to the top 100. I'm not 100% sure on yeah. that. But yeah. a dog that's uh, been doing some winning uh, lately and is winning consistently all over. Uh, here's a dog that uh, a lot of people may know. Grand Knight Champion 2, Willie's Connor McGregor. Two Never heard old. of him. Never heard of him. <laughs> Well, there's 50,000 reasons why you may know this dog, Alan, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw this dog has is, is actually just changed hands recently. Look like J.R. Gray may have uh, gotten an offer that he couldn't refuse for this dog. I know he's got a pile of, of nice dogs around his place there. So Yeah, obviously we're talking about the 2022 uh, Tournament of Champions winner, uh, Willie uh, Willie's Connor McGregor right here. But yeah, dog's done making a big name for himself, obviously in the running here. But yeah, I did also see what you mentioned got. Uh, changed hands recently so hopefully those guys will keep winning with the dog yeah there we go it, it, dog double cast wins at winter classic uh it, he's already qualified for the world so just uh, has to get the autumn oaks and make a run and see what he can do in the zones and he'll be a real contender in this program yeah yeah yep. uh, another one here that jr gray owns along with ellis keen uh night champion willie's insane scar uh, just a two-year-old female um was actually on facebook just not long ago and saw some videos of uh just earlier today of JR posted from last night with this scar female must be the dog that he's hunting currently him and Eric Emery and pretty nice little female. Yeah. 
Well, they're they're hunting some good dogs, but you know, one of the things that makes them as good as they are because they are putting the time into them. Yeah, they're putting some bootstraps into these dogs, and it's and all of these young hounds. You know, uh, they don't Connor do McGregor didn't get to to where he was without all that time in the woods, and and I'm sure the scar females another one, all of them that those boys are hunting. You don't. And that's one thing it. that they're very good at. They have all these. They have these friends are all helping each other out. You know, putting all the the hunt time into them and really singling these dogs out. You know, and and really working together as a team is what is what they're having a lot of success with doing. Yeah, I got to interview Jr. after he won the tournament champions, and we talked a lot about you know having Willie and this the stud dog business and how that takes such a team and people. He has all this group of people that are pushing mm-hmm. pups and mm-hmm. young dogs to get them started out of Willie and. You can he's he's reaping the benefits of the of that program for sure. Yeah, you know the other thing I always go back to is the world hunt. I remember that final cast. Nobody really knew who J.R. Gray was when he was, had Willie in the final cast. You know, and here's bringing this coon dog to the world championship, <laughs> and he's winning. He did everything he could to give it away, yeah. you know. But uh, and and not just that. Now he's just reproducing all these nice young hounds. It's going to be a major reproducer when it's all yep. said and done. Already yep. is. Yep. And the last tree and walker that uh, double cast wins at Winter Classic was Huggins Carmen, a two year old female owned by Ben Huggins of Alabama. There you go, another Southern dog. Here's one uh, ex bred dog that had double cast wins there, and that is Night Champion Set 'em Up Rip, a three year old male uh, owned by Clarence Stillman of Mississippi. This is the dog that won the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, and a good good looking sucker too. Yeah. You see all kinds of pictures on our Facebook pages from the Winter Classic results, but uh, yeah, there's a that's a nice dog. They say it's a Walker black and tan cross. It is a yeah. yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good looking dog. Uh, he wouldn't look like, look at like it doesn't look like he has any black and tan in him. Looking at the at the pictures, but yeah, that's what he is. Currently, no leopard or sorry, no leopards, blue ticks, plots, or red bones had double cast wins at Winter Classic, so there were none in our standings here. And just uh, to recap, that seven of the twenty dogs that are right now tied are are qualified for the world so but for the other 13 there's still ample ample opportunity to get qualified and compete in that program as well yeah and, and i i hope they do because this uh i hope to see them at autumn oaks all of them i mean we never see all of them you know but uh, oftentimes we see a good majority of them yeah and that's uh one cast win at uh at autumn oaks is we'll put them in the driver's seat going into the world championship that's right and and speaking on that, there's only two events left on the calendar this year to compete on with with uh, Winter Classic being done. You got Autumn Oaks coming up September 2nd and 3rd in uh, Richmond, Indiana. Obviously, the pre-entry deadline is August 12th, uh, but we'll be taking walk-ups as guides, depending on guide availability there on the ground. So if you miss that, it's not the worst thing in the world, but try to get entered up and ensure that you can hunt. And then you got the World the world Hunt. RQEs are running from uh, from now to the end of August. Um, the zones are going to be September 16th and 17th, and the finals will be September 22nd through 24th. And all that information is available on our website, magazine, uh, anywhere you look at that's regarding UKC, you'll find that information. Yeah, now shifting gears from the Triple Crown, we're going to talk a little bit about rules again. Uh, I think people are enjoying our rules segment. So today we're going to talk about telemetry rules. Uh, this is still a, a fairly new concept in the whole grand scheme of competition coon hunting, right? Using your telemetry system during the events. Uh, you were here when the the rule, the rule, telemetry rules were implemented into our system, right? When was that? I want to say that was in 2014 when we implemented it. But, you know, talk had went on for almost two years before that. Started talking about the idea of allowing their use. And uh, I talked to a lot of hunters about it. And, you know, really uh, most of them that I talked to were like, Begin with some of them are a little hesitant. Yeah. Like, how would this work? Are you going to, it's something, the whole concept of using is totally new. But like anything else, a, a big, that was a big change. But uh, the more we talked about it, it just made a whole lot of sense. You know, I remember the big thing was the pros and the cons. There's a lot of pros and some good pros to consider. There were a couple of cons too. You know, but at the end of the day, kind of like a lot of decisions, you make you weigh out those pros and cons and, and that's how you make your decisions. This was certainly one of those. Yeah. So back in those, uh, you're talking about two years before that, you're talking 2011, 2012, that's not just handheld, uh, telemetry systems. That's some, you're seeing some beep, beep callers and everything else still at that time, right? It is. Yeah. You know, and a lot of them actually, Yeah. you know, it's kind of GPS was coming out, being more popular at that time, you know, and kind of coming on and, um. 
but yeah, it was it was a it was a big deal at the time. We actually ran some pilot hunts, and I don't know that we've done any pilot test hunts yet since you've been here or not. But it's a good way to try something, you know, just like just like this. We set up a couple designated events that we uh, advertised as being pilot tests for allowing the use of telemetry. So I remember one of them that we did that I went to was in at the Battle of the Breeds in Ada, Oklahoma. Yep. And uh, on Friday night, we I went there with plenty of printouts for, uh, had four sheets for every every cast where every handler was supposed to, yes, I like this part. I didn't like this part of it. I like this. I, I forget all the, the, the questions or all the items that were listed on that. But what it was is it allowed us to get feedback from everybody that was there. And that was Battle of the Breeds is a major event. So we got a lot of guys trying it. And I remember um, talking about it that night on Friday night to the hunters before draw out. And I would say, I would, I just kind of got the feel that it was probably 60 40. And 60, I'm talking 40 for it and 60 against it. Gotcha. And, um, you know, and I tried to tell him, I said, you know, let's get, let's give it a shot. You know, let's use this and, and give it a shot. Some different things we talked about, you know, and uh, I didn't go into a whole lot of detail other than I had some written every judge with every scorecard. There were some, some specifics and details that went with them. You can use it for this and this and this and this, uh, but maybe not this or this or what have you. And then at the end of the night, you know, uh, I want to hear your feedback and not just that. Uh, wanted them to fill it out, you know, sign it off on it and everything, turn it in with their cast, with their scorecard that night. But also if they felt like it the next day, uh, let's talk about it. I want to hear what some of your feedback is from it. And you could hear uh, some mumblings and this and that, you know, that, that night before they went out. But the next day, I remember a lot of guys came up to the table and we discussed it. And there were a lot of, I'd say it was about 60, 40 again by the second day, but it was flip-flop. Flipped them, huh? Yeah, about yeah. 60 for it and 40 against it. There was some different, I don't remember all the feedback that we got. You know, I remember one was a guy came up to me and he said, man, our dogs got on the other side of this uh, this creek, a big wide creek or river, little river, I guess they had. And one of the things he pointed out, he said, we could look on our, on our uh, telemetry system, on our mapping, and see where a bridge was where we could cross. Yep. And he said, if we had not, if we wouldn't have had that, we'd have never known where to go. And it saved us a lot of time. We might have went the wrong way. Sure. And walked forever without finding a good spot to cross. But just things like that that came out of it. And I think, uh, you know, as you as you consider those, and it's like anything else, something, sometimes it's a, a matter of you actually using it, using something or doing something uh, changes your opinion. Sure. I think this was one of them that really changed a lot of opinions pretty quick. So you mentioned the Battle of the Breeds being one of the pilots. I know that that's a major event that happens, uh, what, second weekend of December. You have a new rule book coming out in January of the next year in, in 14. You're kind of back, your back was against the wall. How does that process go to to get a rule passed and then get it implemented into the rule book with that short of a turnaround? Yeah, that that was exceptionally uh, short, but I wanted to make sure we had all that sure. feedback. And and I had a good idea that we were probably going to do it by that time, but that was going to be one that we basically had everything ready to go into the rule book. It was a matter of pulling it if we decided sure. to pull it, which would have been easier. You know, so we were kind of prepared to, to move with it, uh, but that hunt was going to, it was hinged on that hunt. You know, and even after Saturday night, I remember uh, uh, there were some that were serious naysayers the day before that were like, you know what, it just it opened their opened their mind a little bit to uh, to consider it and look at it today. Yeah, couldn't you know, imagine kind of dog no. news today. Every every now and then we still hear today that I wish we didn't have this and 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 I get it. There it's there's some of the cons. Yeah, you know, and and maybe even the the one of the sad things I think of a lot that has changed the sport a little bit has to do with the youth hunters where too many times they, they it's every everything it's they're always looking at their screen or looking at their screen a lot and they're missing out i feel like on a lot of other aspects that is hunting out there under the stars listening to the crickets right. and what else is going on if you're glued to the screen or the screen 
um, your mind is set on this and you're missing out missing on so that. many other things. Another thing is just actually listen to the voice of this dog trailing and things like that. I think we miss out on a lot of that. So those are some of the cons. But as far as the the safety of dogs, which was oh, yeah. number one in our book, oh, yeah. uh, allowing their use was safety of dogs. And if you remember back in those days, we were having dogs that were getting hit on the road, and and I guarantee it cut down on some of that. Sure. At least now we know where our dogs are at all times, and if we have to, we can go get them, keep them from getting into danger. So there's, I think, the pros far outweigh the cons. Yeah. And we talked about a little bit in episode one of, of this, the rule proposal and the procedures of getting rules implemented into our rule books. And this is a case where UKC took the reins on it and implemented this rule, kind of bypassing some of the other procedures that it normally follows. Yeah, and it is it is one. This isn't really so much a running rule as it was that we would take to the Charter Breed Association. Okay. It's more of a policy versus gotcha. a, well, that we considered more of a policy versus a a running rule, which would be no different than the the use of a hunt director or we can use a master, have to use a master hounds or things like that. Sure. More, more like a policy type thing. Right. Yeah. We'll get, getting straight into the telemetry rules a little bit. Uh, obviously it, it's an important uh, set of rules for us. We print it right there on the back of each and every master hounds and hunt director checklist that we send out to clubs hosting events. And you, you told me earlier today in conversations before this, that these set of telemetry rules that I'm looking at here haven't changed since the implementation of this rule. No, the wording is exactly as the way I wrote it back in 2013 before we uh, implemented it for 20, to come out in 2014. We haven't changed a word on it. Absolutely. And I'm kind of surprised, really, on a lot of things you need to update a little bit, but this is one that I guess we kind of nailed it out of the box as far as writing the, the terminology for it and the verbiage and everything. Yeah, there's a lot of good information on here, and, uh, you know, this is uh, – Master of Hounds and Hunt Directors are instructed to post this at the event. It's one that uh, probably a good idea if you're hunting to snap a picture of it and just have it. You know, it's not changed in eight years. Yeah. Probably not going to change in the near future. Mm -hmm. Get you a picture of this. That way you have it readily available if you need it. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's jump into the rules a little bit. Because like all the running rules are on the back of your scorecard, but this wouldn't be one of right. them. This is separate This is an entirely that. new right. section here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, jumping right into the rules here, starting out with number one, and it's bolded. Um, it's, it stands out on this page here and it reads under no circumstances shall telemetry be used to determine the scoring of any dogs. Yeah. The, what that means is the scoring of any dogs means it can't be used. You still use your ears and your eyes to judge dogs. Yeah. We don't have it set up to where just because the, uh, the telemetry shows a dog that is, was declared treed left or hasn't left, yeah. this isn't going to be. Uh, we're not going to use this de device to, ter to determine that. You're still going to judge by your ears and eyes just like you did before. Would have been like in the TOC finals when Piper's treed a mile and a half away and he comes over to judge say, hey, tree Piper here is showing on my telemetry system, but you can't hear her. No, exactly. You still got to hear, uh, hear a dog before you can take a strike or a tree call. Or hear it bark off the tree like you said. Exactly. If it were exactly. leave a tree. Yeah. Uh, okay. So number two says, if by way of telemetry, a handler deems dog to be in danger per an item outlined in rule seven, which is our timeout rule that we've talked about in the past episode, they may ask for a, a cast vote to call timeout. If a majority is not reached, the handler may withdraw, then handle the dog due to safety concerns. Yeah, that is a little bit different than most of our majority of cast rules. Uh, most, most majority uh, has to do with if the judge will make a call and it takes a majority to overrule his call. Right. In this case, it's a, it takes a majority of the cast to call time out. Uh, so that's in that, uh, the, the, in other words, the judge has no more, the judge's ruling or his vote has no more weight than anybody else in the cast in this case. And this is, this is one of those. So in a four dog cast, at least three guys got to agree to call time out that there is in fact danger to a dog. Uh, two to two is not enough for that. And also, Got to have a majority to call timeout. And if not, uh, it's as simple as that. Uh, the, at least I, if I feel my dog is in danger, uh, at least I may know that. And my dog is probably going to be far more important than this hunt. Means That's to exactly me. so, right. So there's, there's my option. If, uh, if we can't call timeout, then, then, then it's left up to me. I, if I need to, I can go get my dog. That's exactly right. 
and we don't and and in UKC doesn't uh you know you can't blame that on on us you know or uh or anybody else for that matter moving on to number three here at no time may a handler demand the cast walk in the direction of a hound that has not been heard opening the judge or majority of the cast when hunting judges used may agree to walk in that direction yeah and i think that rule was kind of put in uh just to use common sense you know we're not going to if a dog just blows out of the country no one should expect you to follow this dog that is that is way out right and it's really not a whole lot different than it was before. You didn't know if your dog was out of the country or where it was. Yep. You know, now you do because of this. But we're also not going to don't demand the cast or you're not going to be pulling the yanking the cast around to follow a dog that is just blowing out. Right. That's yep. the idea behind number if three. If we got dogs over here in this, in uh, you know, east and your dog blew out west and it's not struck in, there's yep. no reason to cut the distance or try to split the difference for any dog that's not struck in yet. Yeah. Just and based for on your sure telemetry. what we're not going to do, if we have a dog opening over here to, at three o'clock that we can hear yeah. uh, and another one that is out of hearing way over here at nine o'clock, uh, we're not going to, we need to stay with the dog that we can hear. Right. We're not going to go out of our way to, uh, but then also I think, I think most of most casts and, and solid judges will be reasonable yeah. about, about things like that. And, and that's another thing that came up out of that pilot hunt out of, uh, out of, um, uh, Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Yeah. Where, you know, some of them were saying, you know, Hey, this, this made it nice. Now we knew where this other dog was, maybe hadn't opened yet, hadn't heard it barking yet, but we know where it was. And the cast could kind of position themselves in a, in a manner that we could hear everybody instead of maybe just getting really close to this one dog that we could hear. You know, and just being reasonable about it. Sure. Do so within reason and think everything's fine. Uh, bullet point number four says, when considering the use of telemetry during the hunt, the handler may not interfere with any handler's ability to listen for their hound. This is to be rigidly enforced. Handler not adhering after being warned of such by the judge shall result in their dog being scratched from the cast. That one is, the intent of that one has everything to do with the beep beep systems of those days. There were still a lot of guys using the old beep beep tracking uh systems okay and we did not want you to be able to pull out your tracker and be other guys are listening for their dogs and you interfering with that <laughs> that so in today's world yeah. that's probably one that could come out because nobody uses that anymore but that had everything to do with guys still using the beep beep systems uh, and kind of uh inf interfering with other guys listening for their dogs i actually had a little note here under that one ask alan to explain this because i really had no idea on this that's one. it that's <laughs> it had everything to do with the beep beep and that was only what 10 years ago 11 years ago maybe nah. uh, but uh yeah at that time a lot of guys were still using those systems that's right it's amazing how gps has just taken over all that and the last uh the last one here underneath the rules is uh, a master of hounds panel uh, slash panel may not consider any debate that is based on telemetry use. Yeah, and that one you can kind of connect to a number one. Under no circumstance shall telemetry be used to determine the scoring of any dogs. And if a question comes back, uh, that applies to the master hounds or the hunt director as well, or the panel in this case, uh, they wouldn't consider it either. Right. It doesn't matter. Uh, you know, a guy can say, hey, I look here, my dog never left here, da 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 doesn't matter. Yep. We're not going to judge with that thing. Still going to judge with your ears and your eyes. And, you know, and sometimes, you know, you can have a debate about that and, and sometimes maybe it'd be a good tool to have to use or whatever. But I think, and especially in those days, we weren't there yet really to be able to use that. Sometimes maybe you'd like to, and sometimes, uh, you could, sometimes you could be more accurate maybe, but, um, uh, I think you could also open up a big can of worms sure. that, uh, just nothing, not much good comes out of it. Pros and cons again. Yeah. At the bottom of this telemetry rules here, there's also a section with general uh, titled general information. And this is a, a pretty handy uh, section here with this, the information that you have listed on here. So we'll go we'll go through them quickly here. Uh, the first one says the handheld of locating tracking only systems may be carried and used during the hunt. Yeah, that one, I think, is pretty straightforward. And uh, you can jump in here with with anything, well, yeah. anything to add. But uh, it's talking about your handheld that you carry. Uh, and it can be, it can be carried and used, uh, but only for locating or, uh, just the locating only right. devices. Can't, can't use it for, uh, controlling 
right. uh, stimulate and tell right. your dog. Right? Yep. And we'll get to that. I think we get to that in a later bullet point that has yeah, further exactly. clarification on exactly. that. Uh, the second one here is one we talked about a little bit ago, I think. A dog must be heard opening before a strike or tree call may be accepted, regardless of any telemetry system alerts or information. Yeah, a lot of our systems today have the feature on it where a dog barks or something. It'll give yep. an alert. Uh, but you still have to be able to hear a dog open before you call it struck or before a, a call is going to be accepted. accepted now, here's, sure. here's the one thing that comes up sometimes is uh, sometimes they want to, the judge may want to say, hey, I don't hear your dog. You struck it first. I'm going to minus you. No, our rules are such that you just don't accept a call right. on a dog that you don't hear. Right. Mm. Uh, moving on to the next one, which kind of ties into the first bullet point there. Any handheld device capable of both locating and controlling, which we consider to be stimulating, toning, uh, the new vibrating, I guess that's mm -hmm. stimulating, may not be carried by the handler during hunt time. The handheld must be left in the vehicle. However, the handheld may be used during timeout situation during the hunt for, in capital letters here, locating purposes only. Yeah, that uh, that again uh, talks about the handheld is that is capable of uh, controlling, both locating right. and controlling. Um, so you have on some of today's GPS systems, you have uh, a handheld that will do both. Right. But it depends on the collar that you have on your dog, whether or not it can do the controlling part of it. Right. Just like in the case of Garmin collars, you have your uh, TT15 that has the prongs in it. And then, uh, and it also has the tone feature. So that's considered the, uh, the controlling part of this. And that is not allowed. So now your handheld, the same handheld is, is able to operate this. But if you have the T5 collar, uh, that doesn't have the prongs and the, uh, controlling things on the collar. Yeah. Well, the handheld has that feature if the collar would, but now you can't do that to your dog anyway. So you can carry that with the T15, uh, with the T5 collar. Um, you can carry this, but if you have the wrong collar, like a T15 that can control your dog, then you can't Gotta carry leave the handheld. handheld in the truck, leave it in the truck. Now, the only time that you can use it is when, after you've called timeout during your hunt yep. and then you can use it, uh, just for locating purposes only still can't shock or tone your dog during those timeout or, uh, that's right. Yeah. That's, timeout periods. that's still a big offense. And, uh, and, and so big that we, it's a, it's a barring offense, you know, if, uh, if we pursue that and we've, that's, there's several guys that can attest to that. So it's a pretty serious offense. You can't control your dogs during. Now, the other, the one thing that we get a lot of times is, um, if they, if they take the prongs out of the collar, can they now use it that same collar? And the answer is, okay, they might not be able to stimulate their dog. But they can still use the tone. And the tone is a, it's a big deal. A lot of people tone, tone break their dogs anymore, right? That's yep. all, honestly the yeah. the bigger concern it for event officials, right? It is. It, and let's get into that just a little bit. So, yep. so it's one thing to be able to control your own dog, uh, but with the toning device or the toning portion of the, of the control feature, now you can control somebody else's dog. Yep. In other words, if your dog is tone broke and mine is not, your dog and my dog tree together, I hit my tone button and maybe draw your dog back off the tree and back to you. That's no good. That's and almost a bigger big issue. issue. It does. It's a bigger issue uh, than the other. And while we're at it, we may as well talk about it. There's a lot of guys just like anything else, you know, have found ways around uh, this. And there's so many systems, you know, that are being uh, manipulated, manipulated uh, you know, they're painting the modules different colors so it looks like a locating only collar but in fact it has these other features and things like okay those guys just a lot of them it's just a matter of them getting caught and when i talked about getting a long vacation yep that's where those guys end up yep. it's not worth it you know but uh and if you're judging a cast it's always a good idea to do a collar check and get ahead of that kind of stuff yeah if you're if you have the ability to get ahead of it yeah it is it is it just eliminates it. a lot of the hassles you know so and the last bullet point on this uh this paperwork here just says the handheld of controlling only systems so uh just the pure stimulating collars and systems uh, must be left in the vehicle and may not be used by handler or spectators until dog wearing device is scratched and all other dogs are recovered for recasting yeah and then you can use that control button but 
that's very specific. Uh, I don't know that it needs much explaining, you know. It pretty much uh, gives goes right into detail, you know. Until dog-wearing device is scratched and all other dogs are recovered for recasting, then only can I use my controlling device. So be sure that this uh, this piece of paper here is available at all the clubs. It'll be there. It'll be on our website. Become familiar with these telemetry rules because a violation of these rules is a serious event offense. And as you can see here at the bottom, controlling device rule violations will uh, result in suspension. Mm-hmm. So um, uh, one one thing we will plead to you is that we're not at every event. It's going to take event officials, uh, the judges of the cast, and fellow hunters to police themselves and to make sure that people are going by the correct rules. Yeah, yeah. And you, you mentioned it, judges can uh, help that a whole lot just by uh, making sure everybody is in compliance before they ever kick off the hunt. Well, that kind of wraps up the stuff that we have here today. Um, I know we have a, a lot of future episodes that we're cooking up, and we hope you guys are enjoying this. We're sure enjoying yeah, it. Yeah, this was some good stuff today. I, I enjoy I like that we're able to talk about some of our players, like just like the uh, uh, the Triple Crown. Yeah, some of the guys in, or the dogs and the and the owners in the standings and everything. So that's good. So I enjoyed it. Well, they've they've earned that recognition, and, and this yeah. is a great platform to to introduce them. So uh, stay tuned, and maybe next time we'll talk about your dog. Thanks for listening to the UKC Hunting Ops podcast. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts, and to like and follow UKC Hunting Ops on Facebook and Instagram.